250 years on from Captain James Cook's first voyage across the Pacific, his legacy remains as controversial now as ever. Although still unmapped by Europeans, the land and sea Cook would encounter was not unknown. Indigenous people had lived, fought and traded on those shores for thousands of years. The Pacific in the wake of Captain Cook with Sam Neill sees the well-known and much-admired actor travel in Cook's footsteps, uncovering a new perspective from the Indigenous communities left in his wake. Sam Neill, welcome to Speaking Out. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> what interested you in this project? Look, I've always been a history nut, I suppose. Although I, I think nut's the wrong word because I think it's terribly important. I think probably... The most important lessons I had at school were history. And I regret that it seems to have sort of dropped away in importance from the school syllabus, even though a lot of the history we were taught was misleading. And we were taught a lot of uh, nonsense about Cook, really. I have to say, at the end of this series, I still admire Cook immensely. But I knew before we started this that what I was really interested to know was what the view of Cook was like from the shore. And uh, I wanted to, as much as anything, uh, strike a balance in this. And that meant listening as much as anything. I wanted to listen to people. I wanted to listen to those indigenous voices around around the Pacific because the Cook narrative is is very familiar, over-familiar really, but those voices have not been heard nearly enough. I was taken aback. I knew there was resentment about Cook in places. I wasn't prepared for how deep those feelings run. And um, that really took me by surprise. I was flat-footed by it. It's it's not surprising to me because I do know that a lot of Aboriginal people in Australia have mm. a very visceral reaction to Cook as soon as you say the name. Mm. But I think one of the things that's really interesting about the series in its totality is that you do capture that that very um, strong antagonism towards Cook. But there's a range of other Indigenous responses to Cook that's quite varied. Yes, indeed. And look, no one encounter was the same as another. I, I love the accounts of, for instance, his time in what is called Botany Bay now. They called it Stingray Bay originally because there were so many big fish there. They, they just... They'd lived on this wonderful seafood all the time they were there. But um, it's extraordinary sort of contrast between the Australian reception and everywhere else in the Pacific. Everywhere else in the, in the Pacific, they were challenged. The people were curious. They wanted to trade. There, there was often conflict. Here, people just evaporated. It was like they, it was like they didn't want to know this. It, it always reminded me of that... Um, cultures or song, you've got nothing I want, you've got nothing I need. <laughs> and people would just evaporate into the bush, you know. In fact, you leave the reflection on your time in Australia with that comment from Cook's diaries about they mm. seem to want nothing from us. Yes, and I think he said something to the effect that he'd never met a more contented people anywhere on the planet. It's a really interesting observation, isn't it? It is, and in fact it makes the episode where you do follow Cook's journey up the East Coast all the more interesting because, as you say, Indigenous people at the time, the Aboriginal people, didn't really interact with Cook, but you interact with them quite a lot and you start with Botany Bay mm. uh, and then travel up. From talking to so many elders and leaders, people like Bruce Pascoe, what did you come to understand about the Aboriginal connection to land here that you perhaps hadn't realised before? How interesting is a guy like Bruce Pascoe? And look, I have to say, one of the regrets about making a series like this is that by necessity, what's used out, out of a, an interview is 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 brief and when i had the privilege of talking to people like like bruce pascoe or or Gemma cronin on fraser island for instance who are just fantastic people and then the depth of their knowledge really struck me and and i was often sort of reduced to tears listening to people talking now foxtel has a has a website and after you've watched the series, you can go to the website and have a look at these interviews if you're interested in their totality. And I'm really happy about that because people had a lot to say. And I was so touched and moved and 
often appalled by what what I had to listen to. It was uh, I was very upset a lot. Of, I spent a year going around the Pacific. I was very upset by the things that I was told. For you know, you go to somewhere like in Alaska, which is one of the bleakest and most beautiful places I'd ever been. You couldn't think that the contrast of, of places that we went to around the Pacific was so striking. So you, you're in lush rainforests, you're in tropical beaches and a bleak, bleak place like the Aleutian Islands. Now, the local people there, it's a common story everywhere, were so vulnerable were so, because they were, they, they'd been so remote from the rest of the world. So that within a generation, 90% of those people were dead. 90%. And, you know, you ask people, how do you recover from this? And the answer is often, you don't. Mm. It's an interesting contrast because there are so many of those moments in the series. And uh, the Butchler people of Fraser Island also share with you story of massacre. But I guess as a contrast to that, you dig deeply into Indigenous cultures. Just here in Australia, you've looked at fire technology, food technology with Uncle Bruce, and there's that, that lovely um, scene of you driving along the road and kind of starting to see the land differently because of what you've learnt about song lines. From yes. that aspect of it, it must have been quite transformative. Not only that, um, while a lot of the story is very dark and bleak, it's not so much what Cook did, but what Cook means and what followed Cook. That's the dark stuff. But it's not just dark. What was really encouraging to me were all those signs of, of revival and renaissance and fight back and that sort of thing is is so wonderful. Now, unfortunately, it hasn't made the series and, and some things didn't quite make the cut and I, I got to sail on the Hokulea. Now the Hokulea was the, now there's something like 20 long distance Polynesian canoes that, that travel around the Pacific using the same navigational skills that the Polynesians did back you know, hundreds of years ago without any compasses, without any GPS, nothing like that. And Nainoa Thompson, who is the most, um, he, he's really more important than anyone else in that in the revival of this extraordinary, extraordinary culture. I met and talked with him and sailed on that boat. So the revivals of those skills, of those extraordinarily important um, cultural indicators, that's the upside of the story that we're telling. You mentioned earlier, Sam, that one of the big differences in looking at the Polynesian Maori experience and comparing it to Australia is that the reaction to Cook was quite different. And actually, one of the things I think is really interesting around the voyages that you take is that distinctiveness between Polynesian Maori culture and the culture here. But I guess if there's one thing that seems to unite all of the Indigenous people you encounter... Uh, and you do make this reflection in the series, is that for everything everyone's been through, there's an enormous sense of generosity, of sharing, of, of bringing you into their mm. culture, sharing their culture with you. Oh, people were so delightful. I'm so grateful for, for the reception that we had, um, the generosity of spirit everywhere around the Pacific. Um, and I was so interested to see, see the things they had in common, but also... There's these curious parallels. In so many places where Cook went, he was fulfilling a prophecy. You know, there was a man that was supposed to come from the east. A god was supposed to come back from the south, bringing uh, on a floating island. You know, there were all, <laughs> the most common one was when these, when these white fellas arrived, people thought they were dead people because only corpses are white. <laughs> And that, that was almost universal around the Pacific. People were spooked by these ghostly-looking creatures that came off this weird vessel. Yes, and are they male? Are they female? We don't even know how to, how to think about any of that. Um, That's right. In fact, um, there are stories where they had to actually take off their trousers to demonstrate <laughs> they were plugs. <laughs> you physically travel in, in Cook's footsteps, you trace the voyages, which is quite a gruelling thing to do physically, but, but nowhere more do you put your body on the line for the series than in that wonderful scene back in your homeland of New Zealand where you actually get a traditional Maori tattoo. Can you tell us about that? Because that was more than just a stunt for the show for you. Yes, it was sort of a last-minute thing. My friend Gordon, we were very good friends on, on the piano, 
and um, we've kept in touch ever since. He's a he's a wonderful, a, a wonderful carver and tattooist. And I just decided, sort of on the spur of the moment, not as a stunt, but because it felt right at the time. Uh, I said, Gordon, I'd like you to, um, I'd like you to give me some moko. And he said, okay. And uh, and he said, what do you want? And I said. Gordon, you know me, so you do what you think is right. He said, fine, I know exactly what you want. <laughs> so now my arm is, is tattooed. And, um, but it was, it was a very emotional experience for me, and I'm, I'm at a loss to fully explain what that was about. I think in, in some sense it sort of mirrors in a strange way. Dr. Anne Salmon talks about how... Cook himself was somehow not just the colonizer, but he was colonized by the Pacific. The Pacific really, he kept coming back here. He was transfixed by the Pacific. How amazing must first contact have been, you know, to arrive in a place. It would be like going to another planet, a totally different culture. And there must have been something very, very exciting and appealing about that. And Cook's death, of course, which is, when we allude to this in the series, is something that's celebrated in, in places like, well, most, most obviously in Hawaii, where he actually died. But as I say in the series, there's something very appropriate about Cook dying in the Pacific. He'd sort of devoted his life to the Pacific. He'd become part of the Pacific. And it's much better for him to die there than die in some pub in Whitby or Greenwich or something like that. And I talk about myself becoming increasingly, I think, I feel internally much more part of this part of the world, although this is where I'm from. I feel, you know, look at me, I'm clearly European, but I'm not European. I feel like I'm a Pacific person. <laughs> now, there'd, there'd be people that would dispute that, but... Um, that's how I feel. That's my personal feeling. I think one of the things that's actually lovely about that scene, although you do seem to be in a fair bit of pain with the tattooing, is that it is, as you say, there's a high level of trust between you and the Maori mm. uh, person who's obviously a very good friend of yours. And that level of trust between a white person and a Maori person is actually a whole different narrative of what could have been in terms of relationships between the two cultures. So I was wondering, after going through the process of the travels. What do you hope will be the legacy of this series? Oh, gosh, what a good question. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I think I've always said that th there's hardly going to be a minute in, in it that doesn't annoy someone. You know, that, that, That's that, just that, cook for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. There's going to be people that are irritated by it, you know, that, that I'm revising history or, or you know, that there'll, there'll be cook haters who think I'm, burnishing his, his image or, you know, that it's not going to please everybody all the time. It's impossible because it is a controversial area and Cook himself is controversial and I hope it's balanced and I hope it's truthful, you know. But as I say, look, I'm not a historian. I'm, I'm just a curious person. In fact, picking up on not being an historian, I think you've described yourself as a winemaking actor. And I was just wondering, <laughs> in some ways, not being a historian would have given you more freedom in how you approach the subject matter. Uh, well, I felt I was open to things. I was very lucky because we had some wonderful consultants and researchers. So we had guidance on the way. Sometimes I knew what to expect and sometimes there were completely unexpected things. But I was never, I was never less than surprised by how emotional some, some of those days were. I, I was exhausted at the end of the day. <laughs> I think one of the real triumphs of the series is writing into the story of Cook, the Indigenous perspective, and I think that is the thing that will keep people talking about this for a very long time. The other thing people have been talking about this week, of course, is politics. And I can't let you go without getting your views on what's been happening here in Parliament this week, because I know, like everyone, you've been keeping an eye on it. I've been in Canberra during all this hoo-ha. On Ground Zero. On <laughs> Ground Zero. <laughs> and I have to say, I found it deeply depressing. I, I just thought... You know, humans are fallible, and when they behave badly, my God, they can behave badly. And I just 
found it completely distasteful. Just, um, you know, treachery, revenge, all those, all the worst impulses were so obvious, a cowardice. It was really a really nasty, nasty week. And I sort of, I can only be concerned for the future of this country. I really am. Actually, when you describe the week like that, it sounds more like a Shakespearean play that should be in the theatre, not something that should play out in Parliament House in Canberra. Indeed, yeah. I mean, in some ways, if it wasn't so bloody serious, it would be hilarious. Well, Sam, thank you so much for being with us on Speaking Out and sharing with us a little bit about your series, which I'm sure everyone will be as intrigued about it as I've been. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Sam Neill is the host of Foxtel's new series, The Pacific in the Wake of Captain Cook with Sam Neill, and you can see extended interviews on the Foxtel website of the many Indigenous people that Sam interviewed for the series.